Welcome to 30 Experts in 30 Days, where we help entrepreneurs learn how to attract loyal clients and build their businesses by serving smart. Today, we have with us Colin Shaw, who is a global leader in customer experience. Since 2002, Colin has helped shape the industry with his five best-selling books on thought and thought-leading work. Prior to launching Beyond Philosophy, Colin held a number of senior executive positions in the corporate sphere, leading over 3,500 employees worldwide. Colin founded Beyond Philosophy, a global customer experience consultancy that has undertaken many customer experience initiatives with some of the world's biggest companies. Colin has also advised governments. He has been recognized as one of the world's top 150 business influencers by LinkedIn, is a regular blogger, and has been featured as an expert on countless publications, networks, and at many events. He's a powerful and entertaining keynote speaker who uses practical day-to-day -day examples to explain the concepts of customer experience. Welcome, Colin. Hi, welcome. After that introduction, I'm, I'm feeling embarrassed now. <laughs> now, can you, beyond that, can you give us a little bit of background about how you got involved in customer experience and what led you to become such an expert? Sure. Um, it's a simple story. I used to work in corporate life, so um, uh, I, I now live in America, but I used to live in England. And I was um, uh, a senior exec at British Telecom. And my CEO one day said to me, Colin, I would like you to improve the customer experience, but do it at least cost, which is always the bit they throwing at mm -hmm. the end, do it at least cost. Um, and that was back in 1998, something like that. I spent three years running a program there, then thought customer experience was going to be a big thing. Um, and this was before anybody was really talking about it. So I started Beyond Philosophy and launched my own consulting company back then. And nice. never looked back since. So I spend my life thinking about customer experience, as my family and kids will tell you. <laughs> I'm sure. Well, uh, you know, it's in in your book, uh, you do talk about many of the experiences you have, and it is interesting once you delve into the world of customer experience, how you see it everywhere and, you know, you just want to help everybody improve it. Now, you teach businesses to do customer centricity assessments. What are some key attributes of a customer-centric business, and how do businesses go about measuring how customer-centric they are? Okay, so um, there are many different aspects of customer centricity, and the key part here is that um, the reason that you're delivering the, the experience that you are today is because of about the, the way the organization is. So um, key parts of it are things like uh, employee engagement, uh, the recruitment of employees, the training of employees, um, whether the employees are happy, um, what type of strategy do you have in place, what type of measurement do you have in place, uh, how you design your processes, uh, the culture and the leadership of the organization, um, how you manage customers' expectations. So each of those are, uh, are a subject in themselves, and this is all uh, in my second book, Revolutionize Your Customer Experience. We talk about how organizations are on this journey from being naive to natural in the way that they're orientated around the customer. So it's about looking at where you are and obviously looking about where you want to, to where you want to be. Um, mm -hmm. so you can make money from being naive, whether you a naive organization, so these are like the used car salesman, whether you whether you will continue to make money at being naive in five years' time is a is a different kettle of fish. Mm -hmm. um, so measurement of it is more difficult. Um, we do assessment of organizations to uh, get a picture of where they are on, on that journey. Um, but, you know, things to look out for is, you know, are you employing people with emotion and intelligence? Um, what type of measurement do you have in place? Is it customer-centric measurement uh, or is it um, more operational? or operational measures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And especially all the different departments. Sometimes you'll get metrics for customer service department to be customer serviceable, 
but then you get IT or finance and their metrics, their KPIs for the employees there definitely don't have much to do with customer experience. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Uh, in fact, I was in Canada last week um, and uh, we were seeing one of our clients there, a, a, a company called Rico, uh, that do the printers and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, they've done a really good job and you know they've improved their net promoter score by 34 points in 30 months. Uh, and one of the ways that they've done that, uh, and again, this is you know, um, uh, the work with them over the last few years, one of the ways they've done that has been basically by um, uh, having that measure applicable to everybody in the organization. So whether you're in the front line, whether you're in sales, whether you're in customer service, whether you're in finance, whether you're in HR, you know, everyone in the organization uh, should be measured on customer experience because everybody ultimately contributes towards it. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Now, what advice can you share to those individuals within a business who are trying to be customer experience evangelists within their you know, own organizations, but they're struggling to spread the message and to start change to make their business more customer centric? Yeah. Uh, interesting question. Uh, obviously, Back in the day, that's exactly where I was. Um, and since then, we've spent lots of time working with organizations to help them do this. I think one of the key things for me is that you, you have to remember that when you start to go up to your senior team, what they're going to be interested in is the return on investment. So they're going to be saying, show me the money. Mm -hmm. um, so you can, you know, somebody wise once said to me that um, um, which senior executive in their right mind would say that focusing on the customers is the wrong thing to do. And obviously everyone says that focusing on the customers the, is the, you know, they should be doing that. Whether they do or not is a different kettle of fish. Mm -hmm. So what you know, this ties into the conversation we've really just been having, which is around measurement. So what they've got to do, my advice would be that they've got to start to measure those uh, improvements. Um, they've got to start to look at, um, identify some quick wins would be the first thing I would do. Um, start to prove that it works and show the proof of that working uh, in the measures and try mm -hmm. to tie those measures back to, um, uh, back to, the, um, uh, to the ROI. Yeah, um, and there are other tools that you can deploy. Uh, we use a tool that is a research tool that enables an organization to look at the type of revenue that they would generate if they um, start to improve the experience. Excellent, okay. Now, your latest book is titled Unlocking the Hidden Customer Experience. What are the hidden parts of the customer experience and why are they important? What, and what strategies do you recommend for better addressing these hidden parts? Okay, so um, this is probably one of my favorite topics at the moment. <laughs> uh, and I, so when we, you're gonna have to stop me talking here uh, <laughs> if I'm going on too long. So the issue is that there is a big surprise here, okay? And the big surprise is that your customers are human beings. Um, and as such, um, um, human beings are driven by many different things. Okay? Um, all too often, businesses consider the rational parts of their experience to be the be-all and end-all of it. So, in other words, price, place, promise, um, price, price, product, you know, those types of traditional things. Um, you know, how quickly people answer the phone, how quickly the delivery is taking place, quality. And I'm not saying those things are unimportant, they are important. But there are three other aspects of things that are even more important. And that is about how the customer feels. So the emotion that customers are feeling. Uh, and why is that the case? Well, because you know people are driven by emotion. We are emotionally driven animals, basically. Um, the other part of that, the hidden part of that then is uh, what we would call the subconscious experience. So the subconscious experience is the parts of the experience that you don't normally see. Um, so for instance, if you go into a bank 
they tend to put pens on chains, uh, which tell you that they, um, you know, they don't trust you. So the hidden message that, that things happen. Um, you, you get an insurance policy out and the document they send you 20 pages long full of legal gobbledygook which basically says, you know, we're trying to tie you down into something specific. Um, so there are lots and lots of subconscious messages that are hidden signals that organizations are given to customers without them really knowing what they're doing, okay? Uh, the organizations knowing what they're doing, but they have a big impact upon how a customer thinks and how a customer feels. The last area that um, I'm actually in the process of writing another book that's going to come out next year is around this whole area of uh, behavioral economics uh, or what we would call experience psychology. So it looks at why people do things. Um, so uh, it's looking at sort of the whole psychological impact of, of how people make decisions. And the reality is that whether you're in the business to uh, B to C, business to consumer, whether you're in the business to business marketplace, um, customers are not rational. People are not rational. Um, we make irrational choices. Uh, and yet we think that we are being logical, uh, but we're not. Uh, we like to think that we're being logical, but we we are, are not necessarily being uh, logical. Um, so for instance, there is um, a whole area around what's called um, uh, loss aversion. So loss aversion means that when people make decisions on things, we will fight more for to keep the things that we have rather than to gain new things. So loss aversion affects the customer experience in many ways, not least of which customer complaints uh, is you know one of one of those things. So to truly understand the customer, you have to understand the hidden parts of the experience. And all too often, organisations look at the very look at a very look at customer experience from a super supervision superficial high level and they don't look into the detail of what's happening underneath that uh, and what's happening underneath it the hidden experience is the bit that's actually driving the behavior mm -hmm. but i'm going to come up for breath now and stop and, um, <laughs> and stop. well well i think related to that you know there's so many aspects of it which is what is part of the challenge in trying to address these hidden parts you know you in your book shared the example like when people are at you know Disneyland and if Disneyland asks people what is it you want to eat what food do you want available you know people will say salads but like you point out when people are at Disneyland they're probably really even though they say they want salads they probably really don't want salads yeah. um, that's not what they go so often customers not only is it hard to know what they want but sometimes they will say you know a common thing in the lean startup you know methodology is the fact that you don't ask customers for their feedback would they like this product you actually create a scenario to test whether they would buy the product because often they'll say they would but then when it comes to pulling the money out of their wallet they might not and so there's yeah. all these levels. no absolutely and and you know another another example of that is that well two examples one is you know who said they wanted an iphone um, no one said they wanted an iPhone, and yet now you know the whole area of smartphones is obviously massive. The the, the second part is um, you know we, we did some work up in uh, New York, and we got called into an insurance company there, and the insurance company basically said that they had been doing this survey by a, a famous uh, research company. I won't won't tell you who it was. And they said they needed to improve the, the, this company for three years. Had said they need to, you need to improve your billing. Customers say you need to improve your billing. So they spent um, three million dollars and eight eight months to launch a new billing system. After a new, after a year, they looked at their customer satisfaction and guess what? Their customer satisfaction hadn't improved. Why? Because 
exactly like the, the salad example at Disney. Uh, actually, customers, what customers tell you and what really drives value can be very different. Uh, and if you think about just in your personal life, how many arguments have you had with your significant other when you think you're arguing about one topic, mm. but actually you're arguing about another topic? Um, and it's, you know, the danger is, is that organizations just look at it at this very superficial level and take what customers tell them, which is quite ironic when you're then we're talking about customer centricity because well, and we're not saying ignore what customers say, but we're, what we're saying is you've got to you've got to dive down much deeper into that and use some specialized tools to enable to elicit what customers really want, not what just they're saying that they want. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, definitely I'm a proponent of some of those specialized tools, but I think even for companies who maybe don't have the resources and budget for those specialized tools, to your point, it's getting to a, a lower level, getting beyond just a simple survey question, but actually just going out and talking to your customers, having a real conversation yeah. with them. Yeah, and I, I, I would agree with that. The, the, I, I think that the, you know, if you don't have the, the budget to, 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 to go into specialized tools, then what you've got to try to do is you've got to try to understand customers' real motivations. And the other key thing that I would say is don't necessarily just take what customers say. Look at what they do. Yes. Because actions speak louder than words. Um, so, again, the salad example, customers say they want a salad, but they eat hot dogs and hamburgers. So which thing is more important for me to pay attention to? It's more important for me to pay attention to the the actions rather and the behavior, which is a key word, um, the behavior rather than the, the words. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's, it's valuable, one, to study your data to see what they really are purchasing, how they're going through that process. But then I think also if you have an environment where you can observe, physically observe your customers, get out there and observe them, see what's yeah. really happening. Yes, ab absolutely. And, um, and, and there's nothing like going out and, and spending time in the field with, with customers mm -hmm. uh, because you'll be surprised what they do, what they say, and uh, all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Now, you teach that experiences are not just about the what of the experience, but also the how. Can you explain what you mean by this and how businesses can better address not only the what, but also the how? Yeah, I think the two things are really combined in what we were just been talking about. So the what is um, your product? What is the delivery, the quality, the price, the, um, you know, the sending, uh, sending a package from one place to another? The, you know, the manufacturing, you know, those things are the what. And what we know is the whole reason why customer experience as a whole movement now is becoming so key is because the time from innovation to imitation is now down to a matter of weeks. Mm -hmm. So you come up with a great new experience or great new product and within weeks people have, people have copied it. So that's effectively the what. The how is how you deliver those experiences. So I'm now talking on the phone to a customer. How am I, what am I saying to, you know, customer, how am I saying it? I can say to you, have a nice day. Which I've said the words, but do I actually mean it? Mm -hmm. So therefore, the how is the heart, if you like, of the customer experience for us. Um, it, it, and that's the heartland, and that then goes into the emotions, the subconscious, the psychological um, part, um, and that's the heartland of, of the how. Uh, and therefore, the key aspect then becomes how you train people or the training of the frontline teams to enable them to deliver a great experience. And again, typically what we see is that most organizations have spent little time on training their frontline teams um, on how to uh, deliver a great 
experience. Mm -hmm. They they may bring them in and teach them how to use the software and the screens, but not how to talk to the individuals. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, only last week I was with a client um, in Canada. They get a new hire on board. Uh, they give them two weeks of training. Uh, the training they give me is all about the what. It's all about the product, how to deliver the product, how to put it onto the system. And when you say, well, okay, so how much time of that two weeks is devoted to how to deal with a customer? I think they told us it was an hour. Yeah. So that tells you the important level of importance that they, they treat things with. Um, and that, I have to say, is typical. Um, um, a lot more training needs to take place of the frontline teams. And the key thing is the training needs to be about how to understand customers and how to recognize uh, how they're feeling. So let me let me give you an example. Um, so when I walk in at night and I walk home at night and I walk into the to the house, I shout hello to my wife Lorraine. And within a one word response from Lorraine, I can tell whether she's feeling happy, sad, uh, irritable, stressed, whatever. So I then know what to do. So if she's feeling stressed, these are the things I need to do. If she's feeling happy, I'm happy, and I need to make sure that she stays happy and not do things to annoy her. Um, <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make is that's happened because we obviously know each other, and that's happened over a period of years. But what you're doing is you you people have got this innate ability to understand how someone is feeling, uh, and therefore uh, all too often that gets drummed out of people in the front lines. So more emotionally based training becomes uh, in, important. Uh, and, and when we're training frontline people, we stress with them that, you know, to use their instincts and use their innate human beings innate ability to understand what the customer's feeling like and move them from feeling frustrated or whatever to you know, feeling uh, happy or pleased or, or whatever it is at the end of it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were talking to a company who clearly needed some more people skills training with their frontline employees, what sort of specific skills would you recommend they make sure are covered in that training? Um, so a, a, a few things. I mean, there's what we would call sort of the uh, basic soft skills training. And, 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 I, so I, and I use the word basic soft skills training. Um, so that, you know, active listening, um, how to deal with a complaint, those types of things, okay? And, and that's sort of for us stage one. But you actually need to start to give people the skills and ability to be able to understand how a customer is feeling. So let me, let me take a step back here um, because this could be important. Um, so if I go back to... The psychology okay um, and I'm gonna go a bit around the houses but I'm gonna come back and answer the question if, if, if you don't mind so let me take another step back when you start to think about customer loyalty customer loyalty is basically a function of memory okay mm -hmm. you cannot have loyal customers unless they remember the last interaction because by definition if every interaction was new, you know, they would make different choices, but loyalty becomes part of, I remember I was treated well last time, so I'm gonna go back to this one this time. Okay, so that's first principle. So principle one, customer, experience, um, customer uh, loyalty is a function of memory. So that means that memories and how memories are formed becomes important. Mm -hmm. And how to create memories then becomes important and now he goes to the third stage which is going okay so how are memories formed well again i'm not going to go into it in any great depth because we'll be here for four hours but um there is a thing called the peak end rule which is uh, a guy called professor daniel Kahneman has talked about and he's a uh, in a, he 
is um, a professor of behavioral economics. And the peak end rule basically says that what people remember in an experience is they remember the peak emotion that they felt and they remember the end emotion that they felt. And that peak emotion could be a good emotion, positive or negative. It could be, an uh, end emotion could be positive or negative. So that's what you remember. So if I was to say to you now, think about, the, think about where you were at 9-11, okay? Um, everyone can remember where they were. Everyone can remember what they were doing on that horrific day. Uh, and why is that the case? Because a memory, an emotional memory has been tagged with that, with that, that thought in your brain. So, long way around coming and answering your question. So part of what, when we would be training people, is that we would train people on to think about the experience, identify how the customer is feeling coming into the experience. That's my story about Lorraine and walking through the door. Then think about how you're going to create a memory. So what is the peak emotion that you're going to try to deliver to that customer, make that customer feel? And extremely importantly, how do you want the customer feeling at the end of it? Okay, uh, Because endings are very important. Uh, and therefore, the emotion that the customer's feeling at the end is the thing that they would predominantly remember. So the training becomes, to the, for the frontline people, is to be able to, to do that practically, uh, to create that, that positive memory. Does that make yeah. sense? It does. No, that's very interesting. Thank you. Now, one of the things I noticed that if our audience goes to your website and views your blog, they'll notice at the end of each article, you include links to a few other articles you recommend the visitor might also be interested in. Can you explain the thinking behind doing that and share some other strategies to help businesses improve the design of their websites to better serve their clients? Not the technical aspects, but just more of the practical, serviceable sure. aspects. Sure. So I, I don't think this comes as any surprise. For me, it's about trying to add value, basically. Um, so we'll, what we do at the end of the blogs is by putting those three things, it's just trying to say, look, these are the other ones that you may be interested in to try to provide some value to, uh, to the reader. Um, because again, we, we're, I won't say we're talking about complicated subjects, but we are talking about different subjects. So, um, when we talk about peak end rule and stuff like that, that may not be obvious to everybody. Um, so one part of it is about um, is, is about uh, um, providing uh, value. When you look at um, websites, um, you now get into another fascinating area because again, the whole area around um, uh, psychology and stuff like that starts to to kick in. So you know the size of the button, the location of the button, the call to action, where you put those things uh, becomes important. Um, I see, I don't see enough organizations doing A-B testing. You know, if we stick the button here, what's the effect? If we stick the button there, what's the effect? And if we make the button round, if we make the button square, you know, again, all these things are subconscious experiences. Um, uh, and, and, you know, um, uh, that's important to recognize. The, the second thing is, and this comes into, um, uh, again, another interesting subject is, if you think about, if you go onto a website and you want to contact the customer, uh, contact that organization, where do you go? Well, you typically go to contact us, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, and typically, every website has a contact us, and typically under contact us, it obviously tells you how to contact them. <laughs> now, what's the point I'm trying to make? The point I'm trying to make is, you know, the internet is comparatively new, but what we have done over those years, what organizations have done is they've trained customers or, or trained people on, if you contact us, it's on the main page, it's very easy to access, except. So, the point I'm trying to make is that there are some conventions that have been built up in people's minds and you have to adopt those conventions. But the other part of it is you need to understand customers' habits. 
So understanding their habits and how they can go on to the website and what they can do becomes key. And the great thing about the website, tying back to our previous conversation, is you can absolutely see which page customers have clicked from and to, which link they've clicked from and to, uh, and, and understanding that customer behavior uh, is absolutely vital of, of improving the, the, website, uh, the website design of things. Uh, and, and that becomes a, a key part. And again, I don't see enough organizations uh, looking at, uh, at that type of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, definitely. Now, it's commonly stated that to create a great customer experience, we need to create a great employee experience. But that's easier said than done. What are a few of the, a few of the most common mistakes you see businesses making in failing to create that great customer ex employee experience? And what strategies would you recommend to businesses to improve the employee experience? OK, good question. So. Um, all too often, organizations treat uh, employees as if they are just a productivity tool. Um, and the employee experience is not very good. You know, for us, it's quite simple. Um, you know, again, huge shock. Uh, your employees are people. <laughs> um, and again, as such, they have emotions. There's a subconscious experience. There's psychology that takes place. Uh, and again, all those things need to be uh, embraced. So um, if, I, if if same examples as we've given. Um, but you know, what drives value for your employees? Okay. Um, now, many organizations would turn around and say, it's the pay. It's, you know, the conditions. Uh, and what we discover is that that's typically not what drives employees. Employees um, are driven by when a customer says that they've done a good job, when they get praise, they get driven by the fact that they have friends that they can socialize with at, at work, et cetera. So for us, the focus on the employee experience should absolutely be the same type of focus as the customer's experience. Um, and, you know, because they're human beings, the same tools apply. So, you know, we talk about using journey mapping um, and journey mapping is a tool that a lot of organizations use now. But, you know, is journey mapping being used for the employees? Okay. Uh, and the answer is typically no, it's not. Um, and as the, you know, so you think about the new hire joining, you think about the performance review experience, you think about the, you know, the training experience, the promotion experience. There's lots and lots of experiences that happen for our employees. Uh, and, you know, all of the same type of things uh, should apply, um, but, but, but typically they're not. Um, most organizations, and to a, to a certain extent, I can understand why focus on the customer part, uh, but you've got to do both. Uh, you've got to focus on the customer and you've got to focus on the employee. And the last thing I would say is that that experience needs to be the same as a customer experience. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is that if you're trying to create an experience with your customers, that your customers trust you, that your customers feel valued, and that they feel that the organization cares for them. And those things that are drive the experience for, um, for customers, then again, it doesn't it make sense that the employee experience is the same. So the employee experience should be that the, the organization trusts them, that the organization values them, and the organization cares for them. And therefore, you are now getting the customer experience and the employee experience, and they are they're matched, uh, and they are together. Uh, and again, all too often we see organisations looking at what they should do for customers, but virtually ignoring what they do for employees, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's wrong and not effective. 
Well, I think one of the reasons it's not effective is because however you treat your employees, they generally pass that on to your customers. And sure. so if you're, if you say your brand is this fun, you know, you know, atmosphere culture, and it's not fun in the workplace, the employee is not going to pass on that fun brand. No, absolutely. You know, if, no. if you say you're a professional, well, you need to treat your employees professional so they once again pass on that culture. Yes, no, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, they don't normally. Now, can you share some advice with businesses for measuring the effectiveness of their customer experience, especially since, you know, so much of the customer experience is emotional? Sure. Okay, so let's assume, so this sort of presupposes um, a question, and let me sort of pose the, this question for people. First question for me becomes, what's the experience that you're trying to deliver? Okay, so... Uh, do you have a clear picture of the experience that you're trying to deliver? And if I stopped a customer after they'd just been into the store or spoken to your account manager and said, what do you think about your company? What will that experience, what would they say? So let's assume for a moment, and by the way, as over 50% of an experience is about how a customer feels, then uh, a number of the things that they say should be emotional things. So, for instance, they should say, as we've just talked about, um, we want customers to trust us, we want uh, the customer to say they feel cared for, and they want the customers to say they feel valued. Okay. So, so now the issue becomes, well, how do you measure those things? Okay. Um, so that's the experience you're trying to deliver. So by definition, you should now be trying to measure those things. And it is literally, uh, on one side of it, as easy as saying, asking the customer, do you trust company X, Y, Z? Do you feel company X, Y, Z feels that you care for them? Do you feel valued by company X, Y, Z? Um, so on, on one side of it, you know, it, it's as simple as that. Uh, and that can, should be done at a strategic level, i.e., you know, once every month, once every three months, uh, but also could be done by transaction. The other part of it that is a little bit more involved, but um, um, let me give you an example. Um, so back in the day when I used to work at BT, one of the things that we discovered was that um, if a customer is to feel cared for, then the engineer, when visiting the customer's house, should put on some over overshoes when they're walking into the customer's premises. Okay, so therefore, for the customer to feel cared for, the engineer would put on overshoes when they're walking into the customer's house. Okay, so if we know that, now we can measure how many times the overshoes have been used in the customer's premises. Now we can start asking the customer, did the engineer put on overshoes when they walked in? Because we know that that is linked to customers feeling cared for. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is that there will be transactional things that can be measured. So you're trying to create the customer to feel that they trust the organization. Um, so a question could be, does, do we phone you back when we say we're going to? Yes or no? You know, yes, you do. Great. That will evoke trust. No, we don't. No, well, you know what? That doesn't evoke trust. So you can break those emotional things down to rational bits. Which Actions. You can then measure. And mm -hmm. so we would advocate, A, you measure do you trust them? Do you feel valued? Do you feel cared for? But see, the other part you would measure would be the, the transactional parts as well. Excellent. Yeah. No, that's that's great advice. Thank you. Now, why do you think most businesses struggle to see their business through their customer's perspective? And what methods would you recommend to help businesses better see through their customer's perspective? Okay, good question. Um, I think the, the problem that most businesses face, um, and I remember back in the day that, that you know, this is um, Tom Peters um, talked about, is just size. 
Um, and the bigger that you get, uh, and Tom Peters says any organization over five is too big. Yeah, which is um, probably mean most businesses. <laughs> um, but uh, the point I'm trying to make is it, it's, the, it's the size of the organization that starts to become the killer. Uh, and, and what happens is you just get so wrapped up in internal stuff that you lose the sight of the customer. So those organizations that, um, that you know, uh, that just become so uh, internally focused, basically, and they get worried about the processes and the systems and the strategy and blah, 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 and they just, you know, just solely focused internally, forgetting that the customer's over there, um, you know, complaining about something. They're just trying to get things to set, set up. So what they've got, and, and typically the irony is that most small businesses are much more focused on the customer um, because the connection between the customer and the owner, if you like, uh, is so so limited. Where, you know, in other words, the owner is talking to the customer every day, so getting mm-hmm. feedback. Once you start to get to the size of organisations like BT or any global conglomerate then you know from the ceo down to the customer becomes a challenge you know, uh, in the in how many people are involved so the key becomes if you're one of those organizations you the senior team and other people in the organization have to do things to expose themselves to customers um so um for uh, for example um pret a a sandwich company in, um, um, in England, will uh, buddy up uh, people in head office with one of the stores, and you have to go and work in the store once a year. Uh, and that store will have a direct contact into anybody in head off, uh, to that person in head office. Disney say that anybody that works at Disney has to go and work in um, a Disney park for uh, for a year, um, for a um, uh, for for a week, should I say? Um, because again, um, it's important that they they start to see those people. So Disney will will ask people in the senior team to go and or people in head office to go and work in the um, store, uh, work in the park for a year. Um, I believe at Amazon they have uh, an empty customer chair. Um, so every meeting they have, they have a chair that's empty that says that's the customer's chair. So what would, what, what would the customer be saying? Um, uh, getting people involved in, getting senior people involved in uh, dealing with customer complaints, uh, again, is another good thing to do. So the point I'm trying to make is organizations by nature becoming too internal. Uh, and therefore, you've got to do things to work against that, uh, and you've got to put structures and processes in place to get that direct exposure to the customer. Because when you do, then you'll start to improve things. Excellent. Okay. Now, one of the ways you help businesses learn to improve their customer experience related to this is to experience customer experience themselves. And you've been called an extreme mystery shopper. As you've helped other businesses, you know, experience the customer experience, what are some of the most common challenges they face in taking their observations and then making improvements in their own businesses? Okay. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I, I, and to be honest with you, tied into your last question, this is a really good way of, uh, of, uh, for organizations to get close to their customers. So what, what we do is when we're assessing an experience, we will act as a customer. Um, so, for instance, um, we had an insurance company who asked us to go through the claims process um, of their auto insurance. So they gave us a car. They asked us to crash the car <laughs> and then um, go through the claims process. And you can imagine you can have some very interesting conversations in the office about how can we crash this car safely. Um, and then go through the whole of the, that uh, claims process. We had a um, um, same client uh, then asked us to flood a, uh, an apartment. Um, so we left the, 
the water running in a, in the bathroom and flooded the apartment and then again went through the whole claims process. So acting as a customer is is a key part. Uh, only last week I was doing this. Um, and the interesting thing is, uh, so typically when we do this, and last week was a prime example, we go out, we have some experiences, and then we go in and talk to people in the head office and find out what was happening. And guess what? What you find is there's a big difference between what people tell you that they think is happening and what is actually happening. Um, and it's only by getting that evidence that you can start to show people things. And again, going back into this, you know, the subconscious messages that are given out to, um, to organizations becomes key. So part of that is that's a very powerful way of doing things. So to get to, to answer the second part of your question, um, when you have physically got the evidence and you can say, look, listen to this phone call, look at this video, this is what happened to me, and the reason that that is occurring is because of this policy over here, yeah? you can really start to, to get some power behind things. Uh, and that is a really good way, going back to one of your first questions, um, uh, which is, you know, that's a really good way of getting the program off and working and getting some quick wins, um, mm -hmm. some quick things that can be implemented to uh, improve, the, improve the experience. Um, so getting out, talking to them, getting evidence, taking lots of pictures, videos, bringing them back and starting to, uh, to change things becomes key. And typically, again, what you find is, as we've, we've said here, um, what you find is, well, the interaction that they've had. So let me give you an example. Um, last week, I had an interaction in a store with the client that we're working with, and the, the person in the store said eight words to me when I purchased something. Um, uh, they said, hello. They said, that will be $45. And they said, there you go then. And that was the whole extent of the interaction. Now, why is that the case? Because again, if we go back to it, what training have they had on how to deal with customers? Well, virtually none. So, you know, part of the issue becomes, well, that clearly is something that we need to fix. And now we need to start to put the training in place uh, to improve that, that interaction. That can then be measured. Um, so we've had the conversation about measurement. And now we can start to measure those things. So all the things that we've been talking about start to tie together. Does that make sense? Absolutely. No, that's great. Now, to wrap up, I always like to ask each individual that I interview to share some personal wisdom with our guests from, you know, what's one big mistake that you've made that cost you time or money? And what advice can you share with our audience to help them avoid making that same mistake? Um, the biggest mistake I've made. Are you talking about in your career or are you talking about related to customer experience or? Uh, in your career as a whole. Okay. In my career as a whole. Um, I think probably one of the biggest mistakes I've made is uh, assuming that people will see the I, I think assuming that people will see the um, need for improving the, the customer experience um, as a, a key driving factor. Uh, and I guess what I mean by that is uh, I, I, the, one of the key areas that people don't get trained upon is politics within an organization, okay? And in large organizations, politics drives a lot of behavior, yeah? Um, and you need to understand that people in an organization, particularly large organizations, do things for their own benefit rather than necessarily doing the right thing for the customer. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I certainly, in my early days in my career, made the wrong assumption that people would see that doing whatever, whatever, whatever for the customer would actually impact negatively 
on the customer and therefore they wouldn't do it but they still went ahead and did it simply because they got some personal gain out of it and i don't mean financial gain i mean they you know got seen to be in a better light they could cut costs and uh, still you know uh, and therefore be seen by senior management to be doing a good job the fact that it, it really affected badly the customer's experience um you know and i i didn't think people would do that but they do <laughs> so i learned from that that you need to in fact my last days in um, when i was at bt my last days people used to say to me what do you do for a living and i say i used to say to them i play chess and they mean say, what do you mean by playing chess? And I said, well, I feel like my job is, my job is playing politics all the time uh, to try to defend things, uh, to try to, you know, improve the experience. But I ended up, you end up having to be, any person that's in a senior position in an organization has to be good at politics. So maybe this is a good way of wrapping up because it's the biggest thing I learned. And if I go back to your first question about, the you know the uh, what would you advise somebody starting this job be aware of the politics because politics can kill you mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yes and i think the thing is is in order to address it and while it would be nice if it wasn't there the key is to understand that it's there and then learn how to do you know manage it so that you can serve the customer to the best of your ability yeah and i think the reality is again to go back to it you know human behavior Politics exists everywhere, okay? Mm -hmm. If you, you know, you go down to your local church, you play for a soccer team, politics is everywhere, okay? You know, it's human beings and the way that, that again, goes back into the psychology of, of why people are, they are, um, tribalism, uh, social structures, you know, in business we call it politics. Um, um, but, you know, it, it's understanding, all, it's absolutely, it's about understanding all those things. Basically, it's learning those people skills. <laughs> yes, it is. It's absolutely yeah. learning those people skills. So um, to wrap up, where can people find more about you, Colin, about you and your business? So the best place to go is, um, is um, uh, www.beyondphilosophy.com. Um, so you'll see all of our stuff there, all of our books there, all of the training there, all of the consultancy there. Uh, also, I'm, as you said, I'm, um, I'm one of the influencers on LinkedIn. Uh, so I write two blogs a week um, uh, that goes on LinkedIn as well. Um, so yeah, um, that's probably the best place for uh, for people to get hold of us. And guess what? There's a contact us button. Uh, <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Colin, for taking your time and sharing your expertise with us today. And thank you for the time as well. And um, uh, I hope people gain something from this and, and go ahead and improve their experiences. <laughs>